Some things, the more you understand, the more you loathe them. That line, of course, is from Starship Troopers, the subject of today's Mad Musings. Published by Mongoose Press, it is a D20 amalgam of the classic novel, the numerous movies, both live-action and animated, and the short-lived animated cartoon Roughnecks. As can be expected, it's a military campaign that has the players fighting the bugs and skinnies in an endless series of battles. The game automatically raises several concerns I've talked about, specifically in the limited scope of military RPGs, the danger of licensing products, and D20's inability to serve as a generic system. But is Starship Troopers different? Can it break out of the traps that so many other games fell prey to? I'm Mr. Welch, and today we're going to find out if we want to live forever. As the game is a strange amalgam of pretty much every previous edition of the story, a bit of history. The book was written in 59 by legendary science fiction author Robert Heinlein. It is the story of Juan Rico, who joins the military because his friend Carmen does. Long story short, he's good at his job and manages to get promoted to an officer before the book ends. It's pretty philosophical for a war story, but lots of shooty-shooty in the process as well. The movie was released in 1997 and gets rid of the powered armor for human waves, making the human government far more fascist than the original book. Director Paul Verhoeven makes the Filipino Rico apparently Dutch for some reason. There's a host of sequels, with the later ones being animated and of increasingly dubious quality. The Roughnecks cartoon came out in 1999 and tries to merge the two together while getting rid of most of the political commentary. It was well regarded for its plot, though the computer graphics are badly dated now. Despite favorable reviews, the cartoon was plagued with all sorts of licensing problems and was left unfinished. The political background of Starship Troopers is important to the book and to the film as well as the game. In the future, the Earth is united, but not everyone is equal. To be a citizen of the Federation, you have to serve in the military. If you don't, you're a civilian and you don't have the same rights. The Federation is rather authoritarian, up to and including restricting how many children you can have, if you can get married, and where you get to live. Citizens, that is veterans, have far more rights than civilians, though these civilians do have numerous civil rights. They just can't vote or hold government jobs. That means their voice in government is muted. Everything was happy and joyous in humanity land until the bugs showed up with their nasty space lasers and claws, depending on which version you read. The game follows the history of the book, but switches from the powered armor raiders to the stock infantry like the movies. They do take the design of the soldiers from the cartoon, and there is powered armor, though it's far less capable than the book version. Characters will be armed with assault rifles and such, much like the movies. There are two enemies in the game, Bugs and Skinnies. Both are taken from the cartoon more than anywhere else, with the bugs being based on the movie, so really big with lots of teeth. That's it. That's all the enemies. You can throw in humans from the examples given of mobile infantry, but that's just three limited lists of bad guys. If you want to expand on this limited selection of villainy, you're going to need to grab stuff from other books. I suggest Alternity or Dragon Star. As the game is D20, it takes from the 3.5 rules with levels and classes. The six stats are straight from D&D, and the saving throws are also out of 3.5. It brings back the plague that is cross-class skills, and it does change hit points to a set amount per level rather than just random dice. One of the major flaws in the game is that, for most characters, there's only one starting class. You're in the mobile infantry. That's it. You have ten levels of grunt to plow through. There's tons of specialists in the form of prestige classes, and those come in three-level packages that you have to finish to get all the benefits. There's no dipping into levels if you leave a prestige class early. It's forever closed off. At level one, everyone starts out the same. Of course, you're all human. That's the first thing that sticks out compared to other military games. Twilight 2000, you have a host of different roles inside the various militaries. Even Only War gave you more than half a dozen different combat roles in the game to start. So you could be basic infantry, or you could go for heavy weapons, or get trained as a medic. Outside of basic grunt, everybody in Starship Troopers is a prestige class. There are two exceptions to this rule starting out if you use the special rules. You can be a civilian expert. They're more like skill monkeys with little combat training. And they are far weaker in combat than mobile infantry. There's multiple options for the civilians in terms of jobs, but many of them are going to be hard to incorporate into the military aspect of the game, especially since most of them die quickly in combat. The other option is that of psychic, or special talent. Psychics have a rough time as they are very short on hit points, and hit points are what you use to power the mental abilities. Again, your combat skills are limited, but they are mostly used for support roles like intelligence. Unlike civilians, psychics can be part of the military, though their unique abilities means they're not wasted as frontline troops. Like a lot of other licensed games, Starship Troopers falls victim to the fact that it can't expand its universe enough to give all the options it's needed to keep it from being one note. There's no alien threats outside of bugs and skinnies. Even in the expanded roles given in the equipment guide, there's only a handful of options for players, with only the light infantry being a full class compared to all the other prestige classes. 
There's no fighter pilots, naval crew, tankers, or other military personnel you'd find in similar games. Sadly, there's no equivalent to the original Marauder powered armor from the book. You know, the one that drops from orbit and then they go from point A to point B and kill everything in between? The one where they fire nuclear missiles at snipers to let them know they're not even in the same weight class? Those guys? To further complicate the game, the D20 system is a poor fit for the setting. Starting characters are no match for the most common foe. The standard assault rifle does 2d8 on a hit. The average hit points on a warrior bug are 35. So the entire party has to concentrate fire to kill a single warrior just like the movie. Hope the bugs don't come at you in swarms. Because of the awful cross-class rules, players are going to be angling their characters in specific ways to grab the prestige classes. There's not going to be much in the way of variance among the characters until at least level 4 or 5 at least. They've got a lot of cool weapons they can earn, but those are locked away behind prestige classes or require difficult requisition checks that you have to level up to acquire. Much like a lot of video games, if you want the good stuff, you have to meet the level requirement. The game does provide a few variances from D20, first off being the action point system. These are your stock power boost points you've seen in a number of games, but with a few differences. You can boost your attack rolls, saving throws, or skills, of course, but the points don't come back quickly at all. They don't refresh at the start of every game, for example. You have to earn them back through gameplay. The ways you can earn them back include attending church service, getting a pep talk from your officer, or role-playing bonuses. Leveling up does get you a complete recharge, but you still have to spend those points wisely. Another unique trait of the game is the prestige rule, which represents how famous your character is. There's a lot of ways to increase this, through leveling up in certain careers, to surviving near-lethal injuries, to earning medals and commendations in play. It's also one of the most frustrating rules in the book, because it's poorly explained, and to find all the rules applicable to prestige, you have to search across chapters. The methods of acquiring and the benefits of having prestige could have been listed in a single paragraph, but instead it's only mentioned in specific rules. The game also punishes your prestige rating if you use a lot of different classes. There is a lot of information on the history of the Starship Troopers universe, but there's also a lot of repetition as well. Similar to how the classic Star Wars RPG repeated large sections of the rules in their books to fill page count, Starship Troopers does copy and paste from one book to another fairly often. The history and background of the setting is presented unapologetically as propaganda, as that is a major point of the film. In short, the American and European powers fight a world war with China that grinds to a stalemate, and the resulting uneasy peace causes the veterans of the war to revolt and create a one-world government where only veterans can be involved. The new federation provides everything populations need to survive. The government hands out food, shelter, and dictates where people will work, but actually to have a say in the world you have to join the military. The Federation harps on how choice rules society. If you want to be a citizen rather than a civilian, you must choose to join the military and serve for at least two years. You can quit any time you want, but then you get all your enhanced rights taken away and you get what the government gives you. You can blow holes through the settings logic if you want. I know it's mostly taken from the background of the movies, but the way it's written, everybody who volunteers for public service immediately becomes grunt infantry. Nobody gets sent to medical school or the diplomatic corps or any other job the government needs to fill to actually function. To top it all off, the game doesn't even offer other military roles to start. Again, there's no navy, there's no armored division, there's no intelligence, there's no logistics. Just grunt infantry for the first three levels. The mobile infantry motto is everybody fights, nobody quits, but you don't deploy everybody in the army for each battle. Somebody's got to maintain vehicles and figure out how much the army needs for its next battle. The book barely touched on this aspect. But in that setting, the mobile infantry was just 50 guys in power armor dropped from orbit. The book also made very clear that there were numerous other roles in the Federation military other than just mobile infantry. The everybody fights role was just for the mobile infantry alone. The Neo Dog handlers, the combat engineers, and the other guys were used entirely in different ways, though they were barely mentioned because the focus was on Rico and his unit. Verhoeven in his book took that concept to idiotic degrees and apparently didn't bother learning military tactics because the only one they seemed to use is the human wave, which went out of style when John Moses Browning invented the machine gun in 1895. Then they armed them with machine guns that are apparently lethal at one mile but fire nerf rounds at point blank. You compare that to the book where it was just a small number of elite troops in power armor that had a very specific role. The mobile infantry in the books were terror troops, pure and simple. They were there to hurt the enemy and make them surrender. The bugs were also much more than just jaws and claws. They actually use lasers and nukes. The movie's supposed to be satire, which might be great for entertainment, but for setting building leaves plot holes and questions. I grew up reading Starship Troopers, and then I watched the film suck all that was awesome out of the book and change things for no other reason than just to add TNA. Spoiler alert. In the book, Dizzy Flores is a guy. 
and he dies at the end of chapter one. There's a few books in the Starship Troopers line, and to be honest, the game would have probably been better as a supplement for another game line. It doesn't have much scope because of the limited options available. The main book has only three starting classes, and the psychic needs protection because of its physical limitations. There's only two villain races as mentioned, no other aliens were added, and the equipment list is pretty small as well. Like too many other licensed products, it doesn't venture too far from the source material, and the source material isn't expansive enough to make the setting varied enough to stay interesting. You can find the books online for about 20 bucks, though some people think the core book is worth $100 and up for some reason. Be patient, at auction it goes for far less. The game really isn't going to please fans of the cartoon or the movie completely. The book is really only used for quotes. It's got the gear from the cartoon, but the setting is from the movie. By borrowing from all three elements unevenly, the game is somehow less than the whole of its parts. Next up is TSR's Marvel superhero game, the one with the face rip system. The game that during its publication was crazy popular because they gave stats to everything imaginable. The amount of support given to Marvel superheroes compared to the other TSR lines outside of D&D is staggering. Add in constant updates from Dragon Magazine and a fanatical group of players, this was a major hit no matter how you cut it. Sure, critics said it was all about the combat, but this is 80s Marvel. That goes without saying. But until then, Roger Young shines the name.